It is just a beyond the hugest honor today to be podcast interviewing my idol, my mentor, my legend, uh, Jerome Smith. Uh, my God, I met him probably as early as I could have in my career. He's had 3,333 posts on Dental Town. He was one of the, I think you were the first townie. We, I, we I, can won, still... I won the first one, but we win the. We, we spent one night, we had a chat room going on with you and uh, your mother-in-law and Judith and Tom Mattern and, and Howie Horrocks and a few other guys. And that was kind of the beginning of it, I think. And that was before it was a message board. That was when it was in a chat room, right? It was a chat room. That's and right. The, and, the, and the reason we didn't like the chat room, this is back in 98, is because we wanted to archive the information. That was what Dental Town wanted to do. Um, right. Email groups were taken off. Um, uh, there were some Yahoo groups, but... What we noticed on the Yahoo groups that someone would ask a great question and everybody would chime in and really answer the hell out of it. And then right. a week later, right. some, some poor guy would come along and ask the same damn question. And then no one, no one would answer it or they were exhausted or they'd summarize it. And by the time the third guy answered it, no one would answer him. And I just saw all these. I just wanted it archived because I thought that was the value. You know what I right. mean? Right. Someone right. could log right. in. Them, but, uh, but anyway, let me read your bio just in case there's – one kid in Kazakhstan who hasn't heard of you. Um, <laughs> undergraduate of the University of Louisiana, graduate of the LSU School of Dentistry, class of 1980. For the past 36 years, Jerome has been practicing general dentistry with emphasis on implant dentistry and comprehensive adult dentistry in conjunction with his nephew, Dr. Danny Dominique, youngest credentialed member of American Board of Implantology in the USA. Together, they work with over 120 referral offices throughout Louisiana in providing implant surgery for their patients. He is a member of the Louisiana State Board of Dentistry, the diplomat of the International Congress of Oral Implantology, and member of various implant and dental organizations, too numerous to mention, and recipient of the Mark Lancantro Award for Service from the Louisiana Chapter of the American Academy of General Dentistry. Congratulations on that, Jerome. Thank you. Thank he is the founder of the Latin World Ministry Dental Medical Project and has been on 35 mission trips starting back 22 years ago in Audiot, Mexico with Reverend Larry Myers and Tom Shaver. And I might add, you're the one who inspired me to do my first missionary trip with you. The project and mission has treated over 20,000 patients ranging from cleft palate surgeries to fillings, root canals, and extractions. They have taken over well over 400 dental students from LSU Dental School and AT School of Dentistry in Arizona and dentists to the clinic in Audiac since 1999. Since 2007, Dr. Smith and Dominique have offered a two-day marathon course in their office called Implant Dentistry in Black and White, which consists of two days of back-to-back -back life surgeries on all aspects of advanced implant treatment combined with lectures. The course is offered every March and November and this coming November will include Dr. Corey Glenn, a popular townie, an expert on creating CT guides for placing implants. All proceeds from these courses go to Latin World Ministries. They've had dentists from all over the United States, as well as Link Harris from Australia, come since uh, 2007 and have raised over $300,000 for the clinic in Audio in Mexico. I swear to God, if they were going to uh, update St. Apollonia, who's the patron <laughs> saint of dentistry, and said, you know, we need to update that saint, I would nominate you. And I, I mean you, that, Howard. seriously. Thanks. I mean Thanks. that from Thanks. the bottom of my heart. Um, so I'll tell you what. So, um, Jerome, um, basically, these kids are coming out of dental school and they're all saying the same thing, saying, I didn't, I didn't place one implant. Right. I mean, do, you, right. do you hear that, too? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, podcasters, um, it, it, we're talking to a huge audience. I cannot believe how uh, fast this uh, audience grew. But all data I have suggests they're pretty much all under 30. Right. So, so let's try to focus this on some kid who walked out of school uh, a month ago in May all the way to five years out, and she's sitting here listening to this on her hour commute to work. That's why we do an hour. Everyone tells me that's what the, the deal is. She, so she's driving to work, and she's listening to a couple of old grandpas who both right. have grandkids, and she's wondering, how I just walked out of school. I'm $350,000 in debt. How do I go from here to placing an implant? What would you tell her? Well, uh, you know, the first thing is, uh, it seems like we learn enough in dental school, just about enough to get us in trouble. And <laughs> it's so important to get the basics down. You know, it, it, and I would say coming right out of school to go right into doing implants is probably not a real good idea. I think it's a, a real good idea to focus on occlusion and, and being able to produce good crown restorations and, and good operative dentistry and, and being able to get patients numb and, and just, just 
getting some of those skills down pat. Seems like that takes a few years to where we really start to feel comfortable just doing dentistry day in and day out and, and, and really learning some of the finer things about dentistry before jumping into to the implant realm. And having said that, you know, nowadays, it, it seemed like back in the 80s, you don't have to fly across the United States to go hear Carl Misch or to go hear uh, Tom Golick or, or, or someone like that to get that sort of information. Now we have an, an abundance of resources out there, including Dentaltown and, and Aaron Garg's continuum. Uh, the the uh, uh, American Academy of Implant Dentistry has got a lot of seminars that are going on. Uh, you know, there's a, it, the, the problem is, is trying to decide where to go. You know what I'm saying? So I, I've noticed out of all the hands-on places you mentioned, the first one out of your mouth was Aaron Garg. You, yes. So are you a big recommender of that one? I, the reason I would recommend it is because obviously this guy's been involved for a long time and, he, and he, he's got a very good reputation. And I have quite a few friends that have gone through his continuum that had nothing but wonderful things to say about it. And it was really the thing that got them in, into this thing in, in a big way. Because it's, in, in addition to the uh, didactic portion, I think he brings groups down to the Dominican Republic and they have an opportunity to do a lot of hands-on uh, 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 implant dentistry down there. Yeah, and um, Dominican Republic is just a neat place. I mean, right. er, er, your buddy Eric Harris, our buddy goes there a lot. Right, right. we right. got a dozen right. dental schools. I mean, it's a beautiful place. But I have a, quite a few friends that have gone through his continuum and that have gone down to the dinner, Dominican Republic and, and just uh, you know couldn't say enough about how well it worked out for them. So I think that's a, good, a really good route to go. Well, do you, do you talk to Aaron much? Uh, Harris? Uh, no, Arun Garg. Uh, no, I, 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 we interact a little bit on Dentaltown, and uh, he actually put together a continuum that took place in New Orleans, Louisiana, so that's, that was kind of the hookup for us. A lot of local guys went through his, his uh, continuum, which he had in New Orleans, I think it was a couple of years ago. Well, I just sent you and him a podcast. Uh, that'll be the best follow-up question to have. I'll just have him uh, follow yours. Sure. Um, so, so go. So you, you, you. Uh, you know, in football, you know, you got to learn your block, your tackle, your catch the ball, pass it. So you've learned your basics, and you're starting to advance. Um, Arun Garg, would would he recommend a certain system? I mean, I mean, I got this question yesterday three right. different times. They're saying, you know, well, you know, there's Megagen. And is it good that um, it was bought by Strawman? And Strawman just bought um, MDI out of um, Israel and the largest one out of Brazil. Then other people right. are saying, and then they're saying, well, you know, there's uh, Danaher bought uh, Noble BioCare and Imp I mean, there's just so many systems. Right, you could right. probably rationalize a hundred different ways right. of and, why. And, and, I, and I've used 12 different systems. You know, we started off with Corvette and then Calcitech and then this one and that one. And this is Blue Sky Bio, which I still use to this day. It's a wonderful system. And we also use uh, Megagen as well. But you interviewed Howard Gluckman uh, not, not too long ago. And one of the things he said is, you know, basically the systems are pretty similar. It's, it's more a matter of trying to develop those skills and the know-how and also being able to handle complications, which I think is going to become a much bigger issue in, 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 in years to come. Well, it's funny because when you think of a root canal, you're thinking, okay, did this thing fail? Was this thing successful um, histologically? Was it successful clinically? Right. And what time span are you talking about? And I don't even think we've got a definition of when an implant even fails because it seems like if you can still chew a cheeseburger, fry, and a Coke, right, right. You know, the dentists right. are leaving it, and right. you, could, you could be cleaning blood out from underneath that with a pipe cleaner. Right, uh, so, right. So, Jerome, when, when do you draw the line that says, okay, th this thing's got to come out? And this patient's like, I don't have any pain because it's periimplantitis. Right, uh, I'm right. eating cheeseburgers, and you're sitting there thinking, okay, you lost. So, talk about it. But what's your definition well, of a failure of when the patient's got to um, go through replacement? Well, you know, there's so many factors from, you know, is it a, is it a soft tissue problem? Is it an issue with lack of attached tissue? Uh, what what part is the patient paying that play in this whole uh, scenario? You know, are, are they incapable of, of 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 you know mastering the toothbrush? You know, it, 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 there's so many. Are they still smoking? Uh, you know, are they doing what they're supposed to do with regard to comb care? You know, there, there's just so many things to look at that it's it's hard to say 
what the definition is, it, you know, if we have a single implant replacing two thumb at 30 and we've got, you know, four or five millimeters of bone loss and we've got bleeding upon probing and things which would indicate active disease, then we've got to really think about doing something. If they've got more than 50% bone loss around the implant, then I really think we need to be thinking about removal. If it's less than 50%, then we can start to look at, at revision techniques. And of course, that's a, that's a whole another subject altogether. It's all of the things that come into play if we're trying to bone graft around an implant that's in trouble with peri-implantitis, peri you know, all these things that come up. Is that very successful? You know, it, it, it varies. I think that we're getting better at it. it. It's one of those things that if, if for instance, if we've got a problem with a uh, number 30 implant, if we're able to unscrew the crown and abutment and remove it from the implant and we have better access to laying a flap, cleaning and disinfecting the threads, bone grafting, and maybe even resubmerging the implant, I think we have a much better opportunity to salvage an implant like that versus We've got one where we can't take the crown off and we're trying to operate around it and, and try and regenerate. That's a lot more difficult to do. So, so just out of, the, out, of, out of the gate, are you recommending screw retain over cementing? You know, I love, and, and my partner, Dr. Domag, does as well. I really love them. There have been some issues with... You really the, love what? I love a screw in crown. But there have been some issues with... The crown is actually cemented to a titanium base, and if the base is of insufficient height and width and bulk, there have been some issues with these crowns debonding from the titanium base. So I think that some of the labs that I've used now are starting to use larger sizes, larger sized bases. So now we've got a zirconium crown that's sitting on something that's got some meat to it, and I think from that standpoint, I, I, I really like those restorations. But you like screw retained zirconia. I like when we when we can do them. I really like them. And what and lab are you using? Uh, we use R2 Lab, which is up in New Jersey. That's Dr. Um, I'm going to get his name wrong. I think it's Dr. Kang. Uh, we also use Is that www.rtlab? Uh, it, it used to be DDX, and then they changed the name of the lab, so I'm not sure. Okay. Sorry about that. Also, uh, Esprit Dental Lab in Golden, Colorado. Uh, it is doing some custom abutments for us as well as zirconium screw retained crowns as well. Can you email me those two labs yes. so I can put them in yeah. the notes? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, you know, Jerome, um, I mean, tell me if this is true of what you're seeing in Louisiana versus what I'm seeing in Phoenix. I mean, the people that usually show up losing their teeth, those aren't people that are like your wife and daughter. They're usually the smokers, drinkers. I mean, I, mean, right. I grew up in Canada. It's my entire family reunion. Right. Like from Kansas, how, how, I mean. However, I got to tell you, we see a lot of root canals that have failed. You know, guy my age had a root canal done when he was 35 years old, tooth splits. And it seems like we are doing a lot of single tooth replacements for endo failures. And a lot of them, it's not necessarily the quality of the endo as much as it is, you know, the tooth split. It's been in function for a long time. It's got a crown on it, and, and the tooth winds are splitting over time. So it seems like we're doing a lot of that. And then, and, and lateral incisor, you know, one of the number one teeth that we replace is a maxillary lateral incisor that's had endo and a crown, and then it Say snaps Say that again. One, I, it's not a first molar? Uh, but first molars, but a lot of maxillary lateral incisors that have had root canal therapy. Really? Little skinny tooth. It's had endo, real prone to fracture. It, we, it, so we, we, we replace in a lot of anterior teeth and as if well. That, and if that's a gorgeous young woman with a high lip line, that would right. have to be the biggest disaster case you could even accept. Do you even take those cases? Or do you oh, yeah. Give, give we them do care? a lot of them. do a lot of them. I do a lot of them. But it, wouldn't that be the case you give to uh, Danny? I would like to, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but he's smarter than he looks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is the hardest case, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I want to I wanna ask you... That, that's a good lead in for my next question. Like if, if some beautiful girl, you, you have two daughters, I have four right, boys. Your, right, your, your right. daughters are stunning looking. If Thank she you. was missing her lateral, right. I know I could nail it best with a three and a bridge, right? But a single implant and a crown, holy moly, I wouldn't even touch it with a 10 foot pole unless she uh, lost her eyesight first. But the thing about it is nowadays with good technique, with paying particular attention to the biotype, utilizing connective tissue grafts in conjunction with implant placement, 
the the fact that we've got these custom zirconium implants is uh, implant abutments is just so awesome because by the time we get to that point we can make an Emax crown and just match it every single time and leave the adjacent teeth alone. Okay, and then I want to hold you on to the adjacent teeth. So I said at the beginning that if they ever need to update the patron saint of dentistry, Apollonia, I would nominate you, and so would probably <laughs> everybody I know that knows you. Um, do you think that we have a religious dental bias towards saving the adjacent teeth because we're odontologists and we don't want to remove the enamel? Whereas if you and I would have been trained as an ENT, a right. rhinologist, uh, that we would leave the sinus virgin, whatever that means, and right, say, well, right. hell, you got two enamel elephant tusks hanging out. Right, Why don't you right. hook that damn three-unit bridge on an elephant's tusk? Well, to me, I've seen, I've seen some disasters, lawsuits, crazy right. shit happen. I'm like, right, right. God dang, if they just would have done a bridge, none of this would happen. So along those lines, every case is different. If we've got two perfectly virgin teeth and there's a tooth missing in the middle or a tooth needs to be removed and we've got plenty of bone and a healthy patient, I think an implant's the way to go all day long. At the same time, if we've got a situation where we've got a sinus that hangs way down and both, both of the adjacent teeth could use full coverage, then a bridge really is not a bad idea at all. You know, so, so I'm not hard and fast about one way or the other. You know, if a patient really doesn't want to have an implant, they're scared to death, and their adjacent teeth could use full coverage restorations, why not do knock out two birds with one stone? It's certainly going to save them economically. And like you said, it's a slam dunk. I mean, it's, it's, it's not rocket science. Okay, Jerome, when you and I both got our diplomat in the International Congress of Orbitology, we both got our fellowship at the Mission Institute, we right. were on a 2D pano. Right. Do you think the 3D is really a game changer? Absolutely. I mean, this. I, we, we looked in, we have a Prexion well, CT. Well, I mean, you, you were the best implantologist I know <laughs> on a 2D x-ray, so, I mean. Got to have it. You, you really have to have it. And the thing about it is, beyond that, the number of problems that we find on CT scans in terms of failing endo and things like that, it's, it's, it's an incredible diagnostic tool. You know, so many times a patient will come in and they're having a toothache or something, we can't figure out what it is, and then we take a CT scan, and lo and behold, there's an endo lesion on this tooth that we can't see in a, in a 2D panorex, or doesn't really show up very clearly. For instance, a maxillary molar just doesn't show up that clearly on a, on a periapic radiograph or on a panorex. You're, um, you've, you, you've had 12 different implant systems, mm -hmm. and there's probably that many different CBCT systems. So, right. so, so, um, the number one complaint I get on this podcast is specific, specific, you know, they, they were no specific. So what, right. what they like details, they're dentists, uh, they're engineers, mathematicians, physicists, mentality, what system of implant, she just wants to know, what, which system of implant would you buy and which CBCT would right. you buy and right. why? Well, the implant system that we're using currently, Dr. Domang uses BioHorizon system, which is very, very nice. He also places Megagen any ridge implants, and, and that is what I do almost exclusively. I like the Megagen any ridge implant because of the fact that it's got really aggressive threads, which remind me of the threads of a wood screw. You know, if you're working on a piece of wood, would you use a machine screw or a wood screw to engage the wood to get maximum retention and initial stability? And it just seems like common sense to me that a, a, an implant with aggressive threads is the way to go. There are other systems out there that have aggressive threads. I'm just, you know, I'm familiar with the, the, the any ridge system and I really like it. I like the fact that it's platform switched. I like just everything about it. And the, 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 the guy that, uh, that put the system together, I think you've inter in, interviewed uh, on a podcast. Do you know who I'm talking about? Mr. Park? His name. Yes, yeah. Really a bright, really, really bright guy, a very innovative fella, and I just really like the system quite a bit. As far as the CT machine, you know, I bought the Prexion machine, and then I put my head in the sand because I'm not interested in looking to see what else is out there. So I don't know that it is the best machine out there. It, it certainly satisfies. Uh, we're very satisfied with it. Prexion, like is that by ICAT? It's not. ICAT is, uh, is the system that, that Henry Schein sells. Who, what's the uh, Prexion, Prexion is a, uh, it's its own company. I think they're they're out of Japan. Uh, there's another system called Vatec that I really like a lot as well. But you know, like like you said, Vatec you know, is they, that out of Korea? I think so. Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah. You really have to do your due, due diligence. I think Dental Town is a great resource. 
uh, to log on to Dentaltown and see what some of the other dentists have to say about the systems that systems that they purchased. I think they're all really pretty good. But I, uh, I think I think most people listening to this podcast that's uh, a fan of your three thousand plus posts in Dentaltown. You're you're a high tech junkie. Mm-hmm. You always yeah. have been. I yeah. mean, you, you you were you were high tech before they had PCs. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, so I, I think a lot of people we really want to know. So you you like Prexion? I really do. And, and one of the things that that I liked about it was when I bought it, it came with a seven year warranty, which you know a long time ago a group of us bought an iCat machine, and the warranty was ten thousand dollars a year. So eight of us owned this machine together. We had sort of a little. Uh, uh, an, an off-site CBCT center where patients could go and have a CAT scan done, and we were paying ten thousand dollars a year for the warranty. Uh, when I purchased the Prexion, it came with a seven-year warranty, which was huge because the cost of the machine was about half of what we paid for the iCAT, and then it comes along with a seven-year warranty. So it seemed like a really good deal. And I will tell you this: the support that we've had with Prexion has really been excellent as well. Very good. So, so you're liking the. Uh... Dr. Park's any ridge implant system out yes. of Seoul, Korea. Right. Which he just, uh, Strawman just bought, Strawman out of Switzerland just bought 51% of that. Yeah, which is interesting. And they bought the MDI out of Israel. Right. And they right. bought uh, Brazil's number one implant company. What was that? Um, do you remember the name uh, of that one? M- MIS, maybe? No, M- sure. MIS was out of Israel. Okay, okay. And, but the, uh, the one in Brazil uh, was huge. So that, 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 that's just a huge company. Yeah, yeah. You, you and I, the first uh, huge company was uh, started by our buddy uh, Jerry Riznick. Yes, yes. What he a sta- story. What, 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 what a how, story. Many, how many did he start? Because he, he's the, the original he's, founder. Well, of he Hawaii. started the Corvin, and, and I heard Jerry speak in Houston, Texas in 1984, and he had a hollow basket implant, which I believe was a copy of the Swiss basket, which Strawman came out with in the early 80s. And the thing that Nisnik did was he brought this to the United States and made it available to general dentists. Back in, the, back in those days, uh, Nobel, uh, Nobel Pharma, if you wanted to do an implant, you had to be an oral surgeon. You couldn't purchase this system if you were a general dentist. So when Nisnik came along with the Corvent, you know, we bought the system. And basically, it, um, it didn't have an irrigation device. We used a water pick. Uh, to, as an irrigation device, I mean, it was very, very primitive. The implant only came in one length. It was 15 millimeters long. So if you wanted an 8 millimeter implant, you'd take a Joe Dandy disc and you would cut off 7 millimeters, put it in a bead sterilizer, and then put it in. And back then, his abutments, you would cement the abutment into the implant using uh, core paste. So it's a very, very primitive system, but we still have some that are uh, still in operation today. And then did he sell Corvin to Densplite? He did, and, and then, then he, he got would, then he got it back. Then he got it back. I think he it, something in the con. There, there must have been a clause in the contract where they had to perform at a certain level. If they didn't reach that, he got the company back for a song. Very shrewd businessman. Then he ramped it back up and and sold it again. And maybe you know, I'm not sure to who, maybe to Center Pulse. Maybe that was it. And, and then, then, it, and then, then he Zimmer then Zimmer bought it. And, and that's where we are today with the tapered screw vent. And then he went on to uh, start Implants Direct. Correct, correct. And then sold that to... Uh, Cybron. Um, to Cybron. Cybron, which is owned by Danaher. Right. And right. How, how's that one doing? I don't know. I don't really know. The one in Brazil was uh, Neodent. That was the... That's, that's right. So, so a lot of people are thinking that um, uh, Strawman would be a good quality long-term company because they bought Megagen, Neodent. Correct. You know, they're, they're buying the biggest implant companies in all the major markets. Right, right. But but you, but a lot of people, um, but other people say that the Strawman bought um, Megagen primarily for the Any Ridge implant. Maybe so. I, I, I it, it, the, the whole strategy behind this is interesting. It really yeah. is. Yeah. Huh. So um. So so uh, Prexion out of Japan. Um, you like the Any Ridge implant system. You like screw retained. Yes. Um, you think Arun Garg would be a good hands-on course to go down to the Dominican Republic. Right. Any any other implant advice? Uh, you know, I, I know that Dr. McCracken has an excellent uh, uh, continuum in Birmingham, Alabama. That's another one that I'm familiar with, only because some of the dentists that have come through our course have gone on to take his continuum. and, and uh, What's his have, name? Uh, Dr. McCracken. MC Capital 
K R A C K E N, something like that. Kraken, uh, Alabama. Yes. Alabama, that's a good hands-on course. Very good. Yeah. Okay. And I can get that information and in, in, in email it to you as well. Okay. Uh, is that the, uh, yeah, McCracken? There it is, McCracken. Right, right. Implant education system. And what is, uh, what is that? Would that be uh, a weekend course, a week-long course? You know, I think he's got several uh, continuums that, that are, are, are weekend courses, you know, that it's sort, of, sort of different levels. What would be really, really cool is if you would update your, you, you did a online CE course for us. Right. Um, that is just, uh, I mean, it's, it's one of the most viewed implant course we've ever done. Contemporary Implant Dentistry and Removal Prosthodontics in 2006. I think it got 10,000 views like the first month. Really? Crazy success. I didn't know, I didn't realize that. And now it's 2016. But I never got a check from you. <laughs> <laughs> you, you tell me what you need and, and I'll make right. it happen. <laughs> and are you friends with that McCracken? Tell him the same. No, thing. actually, actually, I don't, I don't know him. I just know a number of people that have gone through the program that have come back to tell me that it really was outstanding. Man, that, that's awesome. And then, and then the other thing would be the Maxi course, which um, takes place at the Medical College of Georgia. There's another one up in, uh, they're all sponsored by the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. The Maxi course is another one up in New York, I believe. Uh, and all of that information can be found on the AAID website. Uh, so, uh, so would you recommend to a young kid that that's, uh, they're already a member of the ADA? Right, Maybe right. they're already a member of the AGD. Do, do, you, do you think if they want to start placing titanium, that the AAID would be a good thing to Absolutely. join? Absolutely. In fact, that, uh, the next meeting is going to be in New Orleans um, in October, and it's going to be a, it really ought to be an outstanding meeting. And if you hadn't been to New Orleans, it's a wonderful place to visit. Uh, Anthony Bourdain uh, said that of all the places that he's eaten in the entire world, that New Orleans, Louisiana is absolutely is the best food in the entire planet. And he's, he's, he's been everywhere. Yeah, <clears throat> I love Louisiana. I love right. visiting you. I love fishing down there. I love New Orleans. It's something. It's a, uh, um, you know, it's got a flavor of French, Car Caribbean, right. Southern. It's just a hell of a blend of uh, neat stuff. So I want to switch subjects. I think we beat uh, implants up a lot. Sure. Um, sure. I, I want to ask you a philosophical question. Yeah. Um, the, these kids come out of school. They're twenty five. They're three hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt, and they, and they honestly ask grandpas like us. They say, Jerome, do you, do you think it was a better deal to get into dentistry when you were 25 back in the day versus today in 2016? And sometimes they look at you with puppy eyes. And I had a kid come by my house the other day, and he said, uh, do, do you think I made a good idea? Was that a good idea to become a dentist in 2016 and walk out with 350 in student loans? What would you tell that kid? I, I, to me, it's, it's no question. It's absolutely the best deal in the world nowadays. You know, Everybody gets so caught up in the debt and they're so caught up in the competition and all these things. It was always there. The numbers were just different. You know, the oper if you think about it, when I got out of dental school in 1980, uh, if we were going to place a composite, we would mix A and B together with a spatula and then inject it in a tooth with a centric syringe and then hold a band on it for five minutes. And nowadays, you get a, 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 a curing light. If it takes 30 seconds to cure a composite, that's too slow. I got to have one that does it in five seconds. You know, we've got that going on. Cosmetic dentistry wasn't even in existence when we got out of school. There was no implant dentistry. Uh, there were no posterior composites. I mean, it's just a, the whole thing has changed so much uh, that it, and, and, and on top of that, the demand for dental services is not even the same at all as it, as it was when, I, when we first got out of school. Now it's huge. And so I think it's a wonderful time to get out. It, it, what people just need to know is, it's real simple. If you work hard, and you know this, I mean, if you work hard, and you're the one that taught me, it's you know, it's dentistry is 24/7. If you put in that amount of time and you really work at it, one day you wake up and say, "Hey, I'm out of debt. I'm successful. I love what I'm doing." And keep taking CE and stay involved. And it's just that simple. So, Jerome, tell me, you know, solve a mystery for me personally. You know, it's sure. a, the A and B bottle. It's one drop of each, but when the A bottle is empty, the B bottle is still half full. Have you ever figured out that mystery? <laughs> no, no. Uh -uh. So, so you still think dentistry is a good bet? I think it's unbelievable. And, and, and the thing about it is, it's it's you know it, it it's becoming more and more obvious that it is a great deal because when you were trying to get into dental school, you had like what maybe a two nine and you got in, uh, <laughs> and and nowadays you better have a three point six, three point seven if you want to get into LSU dental school, and then you still may have to wait out a year.
You know, uh, medicine, you know, we have a thread on downtown right now. If you had to do it all over again, would you go to medical school? My goodness, they're the most depressed people in the world right now. I mean, they're getting hammered by insurance. They're getting hammered by the government. Uh, you know, litigation is on the rise. And all the guys that I know that are my age that are practicing medicine are really, they really want to get out. They really do. And they, you know, early on, I, I used to think, man, maybe I should have gone to medical school. These guys are doing so well. And now they all look at me and say, boy, you really made the right decision. So, you know, and the other thing back in the day, um, you know, when I was little, you know, we were Catholic, went to Catholic, you know, all my schools were Blessed Sacrament, St. Pat's, uh, right. Bishop Carroll, went to Creighton. Those big families, only the most messed up daughter got ortho. Right. Right. Now right. it's like even Everybody. the boys, even, 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 even if your boy is handsome, he'll get right. fine-tuned ortho. So dentistry has gone between, well, does it hurt, and is this going to make her not get married? Right, right, right. And now, and right. now it's just like routine a la carte. Everybody's getting well, dentistry. And, and on top of that, there's this paranoia about corporate dentistry is going to take over. I got to tell you, I, in 1983, I was in San Francisco, and uh, Burton Press and Omar Reed and Avram King and two other people spoke at this big symposium. And Avram King got up. He was a, he was the uh, he published a newsletter called Nexus, and he stood up in front of the whole group. It's 150 dentists in the room, and he goes, you know, uh, dentistry is going to become corporate. You have Montgomery Wards and Sears, and they're opening up these clinics. And he went on and on and on, and he said, my prediction is that only 5% of the people in the United States are going to be going to private dental offices, and everybody else is going to be going to corporate clinics. And so some guy raises his hand and says, well, look, there's 150 of us in this room. What do you what's going to happen? He goes, well, I see a lot of ambulatory bankruptcies. And the guy was dead wrong. Like, it, like is Sears, are they still open? Or Montgomery Wards, we don't, we don't even have one in, in our, our city anymore. He was dead wrong. But now we, we see it coming back again. And for the same reason, I really don't think that's going to, that's going to be the case. We have a different, uh, sort of a different uh, complexion now because we've got people coming out of school with a lot of debt. We have a lot of people that don't want to do what you and I did, and that is open up an office and you know, and, and stay up all night worrying and, and get everything assembled and hire a staff and, and market and do all these things to get the business going. So you have some people that don't want to do all that stuff, but the, the people that are willing to put in the hard work and the effort, I think there's always going to be a place for uh, fee-for-service fee dental care. Yeah, he was, uh, he was completely uh, wrong. And uh, yeah. he, um, he died. Uh, when did he die? That was a long time ago. He, he's in my backyard. Right, right. And he was a real smart guy, you know, and I'm just this young dentist and I'm sitting in the audience thinking, man, I'm a, I made a mistake. You know, our, our profession is getting ready to, I'm, I made a mistake and I, well, I, I, I almost drank the Kool-Aid. I mean, I almost believed that what he was saying was true. Well, you're down there in Louisiana where it all started. I mean, uh, it was Orthodontic Centers of America. It was right, um, right. Uh, Lazarus right there in That's LSU, right. good old Catholic boy. Right. Rolled up all these orthodontic offices. It was going to be the end of ortho. He was Correct. building his own schools. It was the end. It got all the way to the New York Stock Exchange, a billion dollar valuation, then right. boom, gone. Right. Right. And, and so talk about that story because when it was imploding, it's what I see now. Every time a doctor sold the office, as soon as he could get out of the contract, he was gone. And right. then they replaced someone like you and me with some kid that just walked out of school with peach right. fuzz growing under their nose. Right, right. Uh, nobody would stay. They they right. didn't feel good about what was going on. They they didn't they didn't. It was hurting their heart. Right. And, right. and they all died. And then they were gone for ten years, and now they're back. Yeah. And yeah. what I what I don't understand is um you know there's 35 corporate dental offices that have over 50 offices. And, and a lot of these chains, they can't even keep their dentists for one year. Correct. Right. So, how, so why are you afraid of an organization that can't even keep their doctors for a year so they're going to keep their customers for life? <clears throat> exactly. It, it just it doesn't make any kind of sense at all. I, th there'll be a certain segment of the population that will go in and get their teeth cleaned for 50% off or whatever the coupon offers. But when people need serious work done, whether it be an implant or they want some veneers done or they want new dentures or whatever, I, I do. I really feel stronger. The majority of the population is not going to go that route. I, I just don't see it. I really don't. Well, I know you were really hoping and pulling for Bernie Sanders because you wanted all health care for free for all <laughs> Americans. So, will you explain how that will actually work when all universities and all health care is free with you and your buddy Bernie? That's insane. The whole thing is insane. I mean, it's it's 
the, the whole political thing right now is just a three-ring circus. Uh, it, it really is. And, I mean, we have no choice. We, we, we can't put Mrs. Clinton in the White House, so we have to vote for Donald Trump. That's the way it is. It's that simple. But, but could America – but what would – but tell these young kids because they're the ones supporting Bernie. What would happen if all health care was free with Bernie Sanders? If Bernie would have won – Mm-hmm. And all the college kids listening to this podcast right now, because podcasters are under 30, and Jerome, right. I'm telling you, when you go to dental schools, Bernie right. is St. Apollonia. Really? So, so, really? so tell, tell these 30-year-old dental students, or 25-year-olds in school, what would happen if Bernie went in and made it and all health care became free? Well, if it included dentistry, it would probably be one of the worst things that could ever, ever happen in our profession, and the evidence is already there. I mean, look at what's happening with Medicare. You know, for instance, one of my patients is an oncologist. He can't be in private practice anymore because of the fact that uh, the reimbursement for the medicines that he has to stock for his cancer patients, uh, he's losing money trying to treat these patients. I mean, it, the, the economics just don't work. The, the, a guy like Bernie Sanders is trying to get votes by just telling people whatever they want to hear. And the reality is we, don't, we can't afford any of this. I mean, we can't afford it. And, and and for the young kids in dental school, I mean, I, I don't, you know, you're supposed to never talk about religion, sex, right. politics, violence. But I want to remind you, you know, a lot of these kids that say these things have never gone to a foreign country. Right. I've lectured in, in every continent except Antarctica. Do you realize that in the United States, the average dentist is on a PPO is getting six to eight hundred dollars for a molar endo. Right. But you're right. only getting a hundred dollars in London and Correct. Glasgow and Japan right. and France. So here's Paris, France, where you go out, eat at a restaurant, that's more money than a damn molar endo. Right, and, right. and your free Bernie Sanders root canal is gonna come with one Benjamin. Right, right. How, do, how right. are you gonna do a quality root canal for a yeah. Benjamin when, when if you go eat out on the, uh, on the district in New Orleans on Bourbon right. Street, Right. A great meal. Uh, why should a great meal cost more than a root canal? Correct. Right. 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 It's insane. It really is. It really is. Uh-huh. And, and the thing about it is, it costs so much money to run a dental office. I mean, you know what the overhead is and cost of supplies and continued education and debt service and all that. We, we can't afford to give our services away. I mean, we just can't. You know, and, and if the government takes over health care and offers it for nothing to the populace, which is a, a great, I, I, it's a, it's a neat ID ideology, but it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Can't work. Yeah, Karl Marx was an economist. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so communism was started was was uh, was an economist. And there's nothing wrong with an economist, but some ideas work and some fail drastically. Right. I have no problem with doing free dentistry. I've done a ton of it, and especially right. in my own backyard, because I'm across the street from the Guadalupe Indian Reservation, and right. and I don't know what's wrong with my soul, but you know, when you have to pull a young, uh, some boy's young tooth or whatever, and it never right. really bothered me. They, they don't have the money, and they'll go get job construction, whatever. The, if, if he wanted, he'll, he'll come back with the money. But right. those little girls come in, they're 12, they're 13, and I just couldn't do it. You know what I mean? Sure. I, sure. I did so yeah. many free root canal bell and crowns on little right. girls from Guadalupe because they would cry if they lost their bicuspid or inside right. or whatever it would be. Right. But, right. Um, but, I want to do when I'm doing free dentistry or missionary dentistry. I want to. I want to know I'm doing it. Sure. I, I don't want Bernie Sanders right. making me and, do and, it for him. And in our town, we have a community health care clinic that's been in operation for, I, I would say, on the order of like 15 years. And every Thursday night, we have the working poor comes in and they get their teeth cleaned and they have extractions done and restorative dentistry. Uh, you know, we th- there are operations out there that are in existence that that help fill that need. Uh, and, and we're happy to do it. I mean, we really are. I just don't want the government telling me what to do. How, how can someone get involved with your missionary dentistry? Well, what's you, the you website? Go to, you go to latinworldministries.com. And we also have a Facebook page uh, as well. And you can just contact me through that website. And what's your, uh, what, how, do, how do they contact you through the website? Do you know the, the email through the website or? It's, they- well, it's my, my email is Jerome at Jerome Smith DDS.com. And what, what are you looking for uh, right now? Are you looking for uh, more money? Are you looking for dentists to go on mission trips? Do you need equipment? What, what, what is your main? Well, we, we're really pretty well equipped. I mean, the place is even since you've been, we even have air conditioning in the clinic now. So uh, it's, it's really improved quite a bit. You know, we, we offer the opportunity for people to volunteer and to come down and spend some time 
uh, with the students, and it really is. It's a great. It really is a great opportunity. It really is. You know, we can always use the, the funds. You know, the, it costs a lot of money to to keep the place running and to keep the lights on and so forth. So you know, we can always use contributions. They don't have to be big, but you know, every little bit, every little bit really does help. And it, it was amazing because I remember, you know, going down there and you'd be sitting out there after a long day and you'd be sitting up there uh, drinking a beer with uh, Tom Mattern and Tim Lukowski and yourself and they were already lining up for the next morning. Right, and right. you just felt weird. It's right. like, okay, well, I'm tired and I'm having a beer. But they right. were just stoically lined up, holding their babies, yeah. standing there like just stoic in a thunderstorm, right. waiting for it to open the very next morning. I mean, it, to me... It was such a, uh, it reminded me of when I was a little kid going on the Catholic retreats, you know, where uh -huh, uh -huh. after school Friday, you go off and you unplug, you know, so your routine is all broken and it gives you time to think and you're down there and you're, you're drinking a beer and you're thinking, wow, when's the last time you saw an American lined up in the rain to stand there all night with their baby? Right. Well, it, it, makes then, you it makes you realize how blessed we are to be, uh, born and living in the United States. I mean, it's, you know, we, I think we lose sight of that, you know? Yeah. And, and it makes you realize that before you go tearing down this system, right. Maybe right. be good to go around the world and see Absolutely. how your, how your yeah. fancy idea actually works. Well, for instance, in Mexico, if someone files a malpractice suit against you, you immediately have to quit practicing and you have to prove that you're innocent, you know, try that on, you know, you know, well, I we, want, I want, uh, that, that's a good segue into deal. So so mm -hmm. there's 211,000 Americans alive with a dental degree, but there's over 1 million attorneys that are alive. And you've, you've had a very um, uh, a no-win situation. You, you've been involved with the state dental board. I mean, I don't, right. I don't, know, right. I don't know how you win with that appointment. <laughs> I mean, because every case, there's winners, losers. Um, you've seen the, the other side. Um, sure. When, and the, these kids, they come out, and they don't ever want to see you. They don't ever want to go to the board. Right, so, so, right. so tell these young kids, um, how do you not meet Jerome at the board? And, and what, what is the board like? And well, first of all, talk about you know, that for a while. First of all, after, after 30 years of practice, uh, to get on the state board, I was kind of like you. I was just curious. It's like, I wonder what goes on behind those closed doors, you know? And so it's kind of neat to, to, to get in there and see what's going on. And the interesting thing is the perception that the board is out to get Dennis is, is just absolutely unequivocally not true. I mean, it just did. And the people that I've had the, and, and I'm not speaking for other boards uh, or, or people that have gone before me. I'm talking about the, the board that we're, that I'm on right now. The people that I'm on the board with have integrity. Uh, they're level-headed people. They're smart people and they really do care. And they know that this is a thankless job. It really is. But our job is to protect the public. But nowadays, the other thing that I feel responsible for is making sure that we're protecting our dentists as well. Because let me tell you, we get a lot of complaints from patients that are upset. And we also get complaints from disgruntled employees that have been let go and they, you know, they'll, they'll send a letter saying to the dentist, you know, uh, touched him where he shouldn't have, or he's drinking at work, or he's, you know, we, we get a lot of stuff. And, and it's our obligation to look into these things and research them. But at the same time, uh, what I would say is across the board, we're not out to try to get anybody. We're just trying to do our job. And if somebody has crossed the line, they've got to come in, got to talk to the board and, and present their case. And, and I really do think, at least speaking for our board, that really we're, we really are fair. We really are. Well, Jerome, um, tell me, uh, give me some feedback because Whenever I post a news story on Dentalton, um, like uh, a dentist in Canada putting <clears throat> hidden cameras in a staff bathroom, and the staff finds it, and there's 25 hours of videotape of them in there changing their clothes. Right. Whenever I, I do that because I always think, okay, if there's 211,000 dentists, maybe some only do the right thing because they're afraid they might get caught. I mean, I really don't want to see any of my staff going to the bathroom or changing their clothes right. or anything, but, but, right. but, but whenever I post that, I always get a ton of emails and you know, you know, why, why are you tarnishing the profession? Why, why do you publish that stuff? Why, you know, and it, it's like, so if you do it as a, I, I, I don't do it to, uh, I mean, my dental town, anybody that follows me on Facebook or Twitter, or whatever, they're all dentists. Right. I'm doing it to remind the, I don't know what percent of the dentists are uh, sociopaths or crazy right. or 
born broken is what right. I like to call it. I, you know, right. just, just born not right in the head. Right. That dude, don't do that because you're going to get caught. And look at this guy. He's on national TV. Right. The whole right. the whole country, Canada knows he was filming his dental assistants going to the bathroom. You know, right. Right. but 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 then how do you balance uh, that versus all the negative from all the good guys saying, God, Howard, why why, why are you throwing Dennis under a bridge posting crap like that? So well, so you see crap like that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So so it, is so so should it be posted or not posted? Well, I, you know, it it, it, it as. It, in the media, they say if it bleeds, it reads. I mean, it, it, it's 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 interesting. It's embarrassing to know that we've got some dentists out there that are doing stuff like that. But I mean, you know, it, it's not just in dentistry; it's in medicine, it's plumbing contractors. I mean, you know, we've got some misfits in in every profession. It's not just ours. I think that um, uh, I don't know what to say about it. You know, it's just. I mean, know, would we, you would you would you post it or would you not post it? Would well, I. I'm either way. I don't really have an opinion. Because I know a lot of stuff you you see, you can't even talk about. You can't even. We can't. Legal. And 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 so what happens with us is, if somebody's really upset with the board, they might be sending out letters and saying bad things out about the board. Next thing you know about this, and yeah. next thing you know, there's a, there's a big windstorm going on, and we have to just sit there silently. We can't say a word. Right. And somebody says, well, the board did this, 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 and this. Yet we've got all this information, which is factual, but we can't really comment on it. So it's kind of an awkward situation to be in. Uh, yeah, I get a lot of people saying, well, why don't you t uh, say this or do that or post this and everything. And it's like, okay, well, I'm looking at a 30-page legal document. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know, right. you just, and uh, yeah, so you, you, but, you know. But it was interesting. I listened to Dr. Shelburne's uh, podcast with you about uh, about doing time, the guy that got uh, – got drummed up with this with this uh, uh, Medicaid fraud deal. And I mean, what a story, you know, and, and to this day, I don't think he really did anything malicious or did anything wrong, but he just got caught by the DHH with some disparities that probably had more to do with his staff, not coding things right and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden, you've got the federal government breathing down your neck. So you so you've got the dental board, but you've also got the DHH and things like that to be concerned about. Oh, I'm not going to mention any names because it'll it'll get me in trouble. But there was a dentist, and uh, I can't say it's in St. Joe, Missouri, uh -huh. uh, but his uh, his wife screwed up all the Medicaid billing codes. Right. And by the time it all came down, it was so bad that they went to Mexico. Really? Oh yeah, yeah because if they were going to stay in the United States, they were probably going to look at a decade, and it was all just out of complete stupidity. I mean, it just exactly. wasn't that, dotting eyes, wasn't crossing T's. And it's like, right. okay, do you want to go sit in a cage or do you want to go to Acapulco? And I think Dr. Shelburne. Uh, you know, did a lot of Medicare dentistry because of where he was practicing. And it came down to about 1%. Uh, it, it was such a small number. It was $13,000, and he had done $4 million worth of treatment. And yet they still threw him under the bus, and, and it, it, it totally disrupted his whole career. So then what, so what's your advice for millennials? What, what, what's your advice to corporate dentistry? What, 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 do, you, what do you think, uh, if you and I could... Uh, um, well, you always, uh, if you were going to go another 40 years, what, right. what, what do you, you think is going to happen? And, and what's your advice for millennials? And what do you say to the millennials who say, well, we're all going to be working for Walgreens? Jerome, well, I, when I, you and I, Howard got out of school, every pharmacist owned their own store. Sure. And now they all work for Walgreens, blah, yeah, blah, 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 blah. They're in medicine. They're in medicine. I know, I know. Medicine's different. Dentistry is still a cottage industry. Uh, fortunately, the demand for it is going way, 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 way up. And and the other thing is the number of services that we can provide nowadays and the and the concern with dental health is going through the roof. You know, it it in the eighties it just wasn't in there. You put an amalgam on a front tooth, I mean people didn't care. Now it, the the concerns about aesthetics and oral health and the periodontal ligament, I mean periodontal disease, heart disease link, and all this stuff. Uh you, you spoke to someone recently about the uh, the you know the, the gut in the mouth and the thirty foot long tube and how uh, the balance of all these bacteria is so important in health. I mean, it, dentistry's on the rise. It really is, and the corporate entity is fine. I'm just saying, most people that go to corporate offices, most of the corporate offices are going to wind up wanting to seek something better than that. I know that's a, that's what I would want. You know, and, and 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 what a great place to learn. I mean, it used to be back in the day we had to go to the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. To get a job sure. out of school, sure. 
and they would put you in the middle of an aircraft carrier out in the middle of the Pacific. They'd be gone right. six months at a time. And I, have a pa I have a patient who's a banker here in Lafayette, and his daughter is practicing in Florida while uh, her husband is going through an oral surgery residency. And so she's working in a corporate office. And let me tell you, she's busy, and she's making good money, and she's working real, real hard, and she's getting invaluable experience so that when she comes back to Lafayette with her oral surgeon husband, she'll be, re she'll be equipped. I mean, she'll be ready to maybe start, maybe start her own office, you know? Oh, I saw a new kid yesterday, and uh, he's from Heartland, and he said he, he thought it was the greatest thing that ever happened. He does his four years of dental school, the amount of dentistry he did in four years. Right. He now gets to do that every month. Sure. And oh, he sure. thinks he's in Disneyland. Well, he is. He yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but as far as that, that model sustaining itself, that's where I can't see that happen. I can't see it. You know, if, if you needed a full bowel rehabilitation, which included implants and crown and bridge and all that, I, I don't really see that happening in, in, in most corporate offices. So, Jerome, everybody thinks of you as a, um, um, you know, ba you're basically the Carl Mish of implant dentistry. I mean, you really well, are. Well, that's a little, that's, that's. No, 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 you are. And, 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 and I know a hundred dentists I would say, that, including Mattern, my best friend. I mean, so many people in dental town. But you know what? I've been in several lectures. Probably the biggest practice management speaker in America is Sandy Pardue. Correct. Right. And I've heard her say in her lectures, out of all the offices she's seen, that yours is the most well-run office, most organized she's ever seen in her entire career, including the one she works in. Uh, well, it's only because I've followed her lead. And her boss, Bob Westerman, is the most organized human being that I've ever met. And Bob, in 1983, was running his office like a, uh, just like nothing I'd ever seen before. So he has been a mentor of mine. And when I called you one day and said, I'm thinking about getting her as a consultant, what do you think? And you said, I've never heard one negative thing about her. And so she's in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, you know, one hour from my office. It, it, it seemed like a pretty small risk to take to take her on as a consultant. And it had a huge impact on our practice in terms of, organization and and uh and, and and running our practice by the numbers managing so, managing by statistics so that's sandy pardue of uh what, what's her website classic pardue.com classic practice resources classic practice resources.com so she how just she just built a new facility uh i saw some, i haven't seen it in person but I saw some pictures of, uh, of it on Dentaltown. It really looks nice. It really looks nice. And how often do you recommend someone like that coming into your office? I mean, how often do well, you know, come it, in and it, see you? The thing about it is, you know, I, I actually did two, two years with her. We did a year, and then, uh, you know, it took a long time to implement all the systems and, and really iron out the details. And then I hired her again, maybe six or seven years later. I forget it so many years ago. Uh, it's kind of like a... PRN on an as-needed basis. I mean, right now, unfortunately, what happens sometimes is you hire a consultant, you go through the whole thing, and you wake up one day, and none of the people that were working for you are still in the office anymore. You know, they've either moved or you fired them or this or that. Uh, fortunately, I still have the same folks working here for the most part. So we've retained a lot of that, that information and, and continue to implement it, you know, accordingly. Well, then let's, let's talk there because... Um you know, dentists always want to talk about bonding agents, and they want to talk right. about megapascals and wear rates of composites and blah, 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 blah. And the bottom line is what we sell is invisible, and the mm -hmm. only thing, the, the patient doesn't want an apicoectomy or an MOD or a thigh right. canal. They don't know any of that. But they do know every time I go to your office, the staff is all different. Right. And, then, and then you go into the, all the legends like you. You go in there, and you got staff in there that's been there a decade. Well, right. uh, what's the oldest staff member you have been in there? Uh, 18 years. Yeah, 18 years. So, so put on your dad hat and talk to this young girl that just came out of school. She's 25. She right. worked at Aspen for two years. She just bought a practice in Parsons, Kansas, and she's this close to firing every lady that works in that office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you got to find the right people, and you've got to have people with good attitudes, and then you got to pay them. That's, you know, so many staff – jump from one office to another because Dr. Tightwad doesn't want to pay them. And, and they, you know, they have a sense about how well the office is doing it. And, and a long time ago, I said, you know what, we just need to share in the profits. You know, there needs to be an incentive in this deal for them to 
to recommend treatment, to collect money, to do all the things the staff is supposed to do. So they have a vested interest in this deal. You know, maybe that'll change things. So you read a lot about bonus systems on Dental Town and so forth. And a friend of mine, Mike Davis from Columbia, Louisiana, said, well, I went to this course and said, well, if we reach our goal, we, everybody gets an extra week off, extra week off paid. So I said, you know, I think I'll try that out. That was 25 years ago. We missed one time. We didn't reach, we reach our yearly goal uh, because they've got this incentive in place. You say so, time off, you know, that, that's, a, that's a nice So, so you, you gift. summed it all up, but just find good staff with a good attitude and then pay them. Yeah. So, Which is, it's just easier said than done. You know that. I mean, oh, people are so complex. You know yeah. what? At age 53, I, I, I think I'm the only normal person on earth. <laughs> um. So, but, but when you say pay them, the first thing they're going to think is, well, what, what percent? They, they want to know a number. So this is what I learned from Sandy, and that is the average dental practice in the United States has labor cost of maybe 25 to 28%, something like that. Okay. Right. So our deal was, okay, we're going to take 23% of what we collect, and that's going to go to staff. 23% every month, every month, every month. 23. Right? I just picked that number. Okay. Uh, like I said... If you have four hygienists in your office with well, us, that labor number is going to be a lot higher. We have two full-time hygienists. I picked 23 as my number, and I said, I'm just going to stick by that. And we take a three-month average. You know, let's say we did 100,000 in January and 80 in, in February and then 120 in March. The average, three-month average is $100,000. $23,000 in a particular month is going to labor, and that is going to be split up disproportionately. It's going to be based on attitude, uh, how long someone's been with us, this, uh, the level of skills, you know, the whole nine yards. And it's, it's kind of a, every month, people get bonuses based on those parameters if we reach our goal. And I want to ask you something personal. It's at the end, so if you don't like this question, I can delete it. Sure. But but, I've been waiting for this. Go ahead. Um, a lot, of, whenever you go around the world, if your great-grandfather was a goat herder, you're a goat herder. I mean, you know, and I grew up in Kansas. Half my friends, you know, the, the, the wheat farm's been in the family 10 generations. When I go into a dental school and say, raise your hand if someone in your family is already a dentist, a third of the hands go up. Right, um, right. You, your daughter's a hygienist. You hired your daughter. Right. Um. A lot of people say that's dangerous, dude. Because if you uh, fire your she daughter, work for me anymore. Oh, okay. Fire, well, well, fire. Okay, we'll talk about that. <laughs> because a lot of a lot of young a lot of young girls are listening to this, and they're in dental right. school. They're saying, "I'm going to work for my dad, Jerome." Right. Um. And what what advice would I give her? And then yeah. you're on the other end. You're the one who hired your daughter. So so just the, most of these kids are young. What advice would you give them if they're going to go in and work for their old man? Um, what would you say to the older guys like uh, me and Matter, and if you're going to hire your daughter, talk, talk, right. put on your dad daughter hat about having family, uh, you're hiring uh, family children. It's, it, it, it can be dangerous. I mean, I, a long time ago, when my nephew was with me in, in in Mexico, he came up to me and said, "You know, all of my friends are asking." He was a dental student. We're in Mexico doing our thing at Clinic Mattel, and he said, "A lot of my friends are asking me, uh, it, you know." am I going to be going into practice with you? And I said, well, no, because you're family and, and it's just too dangerous. You know, if it doesn't work out, you know, it could cause a rift in the family. It would be awful, this and that. So fast forward about eight or 10 years later, I called him up one day and I said, hey, look, I want you to come to work for me. And he goes, what about that thing about, I said, forget about that. I didn't know what I was talking about. You know, it, it, it's, it, the, the point is th there's an element of risk there. It's just there. And, and, and Danny goes, well, Uncle Jerry, what if it doesn't work out? I said, it's going to work out. It's got to, you know, because both of us have too much at stake. And so it's like, you know, when you get married, you know, you make this commitment. And say, it's, you're not on the altar saying, hey, what if this doesn't work out? You know, it's, it's, it's like we've got to be all in, you know. It, so anyway, so I have, you know, my office policies and, and, and so forth in the office. And my daughter just didn't want to follow the rules. And I said, hey, look. I love you so much that I'm going to let you go because you're not going to follow the rules. You can't work here. I can't make an exception for you. So we parted in good ways, and I think that our relationship will continue to prosper as long as we don't work together. So that, so that didn't cause a riff with uh, the, she didn't go to mom or? No, uh, no. In, in fact, no, what she did was she started a temporary uh, hygiene replacement service. So if Tom Madden's uh, hygienist 
gets pregnant, she'll go in there and work for five weeks or while she's on maternity leave, or she has a list of dental hygienists to fill in here and there when hygienists are, uh, are out on leave on vacation, things like that. So she's got her own little business now. Okay, so between Tom Matter and Tim Lukowski and Howard Friend, which one is uh, Mo Curley or uh, uh, the Three Stooges? I think that, okay, you're Mo. I mean, obviously, you, you, you started Dental Town, so you're the big, the big kaboob. Uh, Lavosky, I, I never can, I never say his name like Tim Lukowski. Lukowski, okay. He is definitely, uh, he's definitely curly. I mean, this in, in matter is, is Larry. I mean, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's so obvious. <laughs> and it's so funny because, yeah, uh, there's, uh, uh, one of them texted me, uh, Dillenberg and Matter are both texting me during this podcast. That's funny. Oh, are they really? Uh, really? Yeah. Really? So, uh, so, hey, um, that is, uh, I can't believe that. That was the fast hour I've ever done. Seriously, Jerome, um, we need to do it again. We'll do it again sometime. Yeah, and if you ever um, one of one of those courses, we could film that. But some of them, I just want I just want people to learn from guys like you who sure. aren't selling anything. I mean, how many implants do you think you've placed in your life? I have no idea. I've I been mean, doing it thirty years. You know, we probably do about eighty a month. I, I do about eighty. Danny does about maybe forty or fifty, something like that. So we're we're heavily involved in it. You know. I mean, that's, I mean, you've probably done, what, 10,000? I would say so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just unbelievable, unbelievable. I've been in your office. I've watched you. You're, it's like watching Beethoven play the piano. And what I also noticed about the, the guys like you, the best surgeons, I'll give you one tip I've noticed. The best surgeons, um, they also aren't afraid of their lab work. I mean, I've seen you go back and make a hater bar at our right. older bar. Right. And, 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 you were, and you were just laughing. I mean, you're sitting there doing it while you're telling me, right. Why would I send this to a lab for $1,000 and I can make it right now? Well, Howard, I like doing lab work. And when I was in school one day, one of the professors came up to me and said, you know, you're not going to be doing that when you get out. I said, what do you mean? He goes, you'll be seeing patients all day long. I was like, oh, really? I, I thought we'd, we'd get to go hide in the lab and, and do little things and this and that. He goes, no, 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 you're going to be seeing patients all day long. So I, I still like doing lab work. I don't do a lot of it because... There's not enough hours in the can day. I, it's one hour and one minute, but can I ask you one overtime sure. question? Um, sure. The most controversial thing in implant dentistry I want you to weigh in on, um, it's without a doubt uh, to a surgical guide or not surgical guide. Right. And um, when I, uh, um, but anyway, bottom line is every dentist who's placed 1,000 to 5,000 to 10,000 implants says, I've never placed use a surgical guide. I mean, it's training wheels. Eventually, you got to take them off. Right. And then all the young guys who kind of grew up with Nintendo 64 and computers and iPhones, uh, they're like, no, 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 you got to have a surgical guide. So, so, so there's, I don't care what you believe, there's this huge schism between right. all the older people who have placed 5,000 and all the younger right. people. So, so the question is, um, she's, uh, She's 30 years old. She's right. she's mastered a root canal filling and crown. She's going to go place an implant. To surgical guide or not to surgical guide? That is the question. Well, here's the answer. If you look to my right right here, I don't know if you could see this. See that blue light right there? Yep. That is a 3D printer. And thanks to Corey Glenn and Blue Sky Bio and Albert Zickman and, and, and Sheldon Lerner, now we have the ability in our own offices to download the Blue Sky Bio software, which costs nothing. We could design our own guides and we could print them out on a, on a Robox printer, which costs $1,500. And I don't care how many implants you've done, if you've got a guide that you could snap into the patient's mouth and nail that thing with a pilot drill, I think that's the way to go. You know, so one what's of the, the name of the 3D printer? It's called Robox, R O B O X. Can you do me a big favor? Yes. On your 3D printer, have it print me out another 3D printer. Okay. <laughs> well, the makeup bot, the, one of the original ones, uh, said that you could print out all the parts and you could replicate itself. But the thing about it is, I started doing guides. I, I, I started trying to do guides about six or seven years ago. It was a huge pain in the ass because, you know, the, the, the software was expensive. It was, it was a whole lot of steps involved. And then you, you didn't even have to get online with a tech and, and go to me go to a meeting and design the thing, and then you'd have to send it off. It was $350 to have a guide made. You had to wait two weeks and all this. Now, 
you know, we can, we can do a CAT scan on a patient. We can do a CAT scan of the model. We can merge the two together, thanks to Corey and, and the guys at Blue Sky Bio. And I can export it out to this printer. And in the morning, when I show up for work, the guy's is right there. And it costs $1.50 to print. So that's so what I'm getting at is we're getting to the point now where all of a sudden you can make your own guide. You can virtually place the implant uh, and figure out the diameter and the angulation and all these things relative to the final tooth position. Then you can print your own guide out. I mean, this is that's why I can't get out of dentistry. It's just so cool now. So how, how dentists want details. Everything you just said, they want to know. Um, how can we make that everything you just said on that uh, diet a, an online C course? Well, it, you know, that's where you got to talk to Corey. And he has been, and you interviewed him, uh, you did a podcast with him, and you know his whole story. He's, he's, he's working with Blue Sky Bio because he's unable to practice right now. And he has done a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work in producing these YouTube videos, which are right there on the internet. And he'll walk you through all the steps involved in everything from a single molar replacement to doing a full arch uh, in a maxillary case, et cetera, because they're all different. And those tutorials that he's put together online are just invaluable. I learned how to do all of this stuff just watching his tutorials on, on YouTube. So he could easily, uh, so you could go to, does he have a YouTube channel or is it Blue Sky well, channel? Well, or? actually, what they've got now is they have something called the Blue Sky Bio Academy. And you could join the academy, go to the Blue Sky Bio's website. You can join the academy for like 300 bucks or something like that. And you have access to all these videos. And you know, Howard, instead of reading a manual, if you sit there in front of the monitor and watch the video and then go to your PC and then go through the steps, it's like trying to learn Photoshop or any other software application. You just pay attention to the video and then you do it, watch it, do it, watch it, do it. And it goes from designing the guide all the way to printing it out of the printer. It's all done for you. Yeah, and I love Shel I love Corey Glenn. I mean, I love yeah. him. I love you. I love Sheldon Lerner. I mean, you guys are just some of the greatest guys. That, you know, that's the thing I, I really love the most about um, going on those missionary dental trips with you is when you would sit around at our age and you would sit around with those students, you realize, God, what a sacred profession because those students, I mean, they, they were more honorable than me, Mattern, and Lukowski. We're just sitting there looking at them like, look at the caliber of people. Right. Right. That dentistry attracts, and every time right. I enter dental school, it, I, I kind of feel like Roddy Dangerfield. He said he would never join a country club that would accept him as a member. <laughs> and whenever I'm in a dental school, I always say maybe I should give my license back because it just the profession just attracts the right. greatest people. In they the really world. do, and, and as you well know, it's so neat meeting dentists throughout you know throughout the country. And I mean, it's it's just it, it, it's it's blessed my life. You know, being able to be affiliated with so many people like yourself and people I've met online uh, through Dental Town and people we've taken to Mexico. You know, would I go to medical school? Do I have any regrets? Absolutely not. I mean, the best thing that ever happened to me was deciding not to go to medical school and going to dental school just on a whim. And, you know, you hear about these millennials and, and how much money they owe. Listen, I, I was like the Asians you described. I was living in a 12 by 60 uh, uh, trailer. trailer, no, no heat and living like animals for, for four years, you know, paying 70 bucks a month for the trail space. But we didn't have credit cards and drove an old car that leaked oil. And, and when I graduated, I had some debt, but not that much. You know, I didn't go to skiing in Vail during uh, semester break. You know, I, I, we just did summer jobs and all that kind of stuff and just tried not to spend too much money. Okay, last and final question. Yeah. Who had a harder life? Uh, me raising four boys or you raising two daughters? <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I I know who spent the most money. <laughs> that, that would be me. <laughs> yeah. The, okay. Well, hey, Jerome, seriously, man, love you to death. Thanks, um, you're uh, you're Thanks. my number one uh, role model, mentor from father, oh, dentist, uh, everything. Sure. Uh, thanks for being one of the original townies since uh, day one. And um, go to uh, um, LatinWorldMinistries.com. Um, and what's the difference between LatinWorldMinistries.com and AcadianDentistry.com? Acadian Dentistry is your dental practice. That's our dental practice. Right? Yeah, and you can reach him, Jerome, at JeromeSmith.com. Jerome at JeromeSmithDDS.com. Jerome, uh, tell your wife, Jermaine, I said hi, and I can't I wait to see you again in Lafayette. I will. Thank you, buddy. All right, buddy. Bye-bye.